best practice using standards and guidelines, conducting new research, implement, implementation of new standards and guidelines. Number two, audit. Auditing evaluates existing practice against the gold standards of the practice and improvise on further. Risk management, it minimizes the risk to the patients and staff. Follow the protocol so that you can minimize the risks. If you identify any risk and we should learn how to mitigate the risks involved. Education and training, on a regular basis, we have to appraise our staff and uh, encourage them for training at attending uh, conferences, both national and international conferences. Patient involvement in the form of shared decision making and uh, uh, take the feedback questions from the patients and uh, discuss with the patient forums. Information IT uh, reg with regard to data production and confidentiality. Staff management, this ensures the correct staff are employed for the correct jobs. So it all leads to finally, to maintain the high standards of care in our clinical practice, maintain the transparency, responsibility, accountability, and uh, look for the continuous improvement in our healthcare. The other important points here are, our experience has shown that it is not just systems, but the culture, values, and behaviors that organizations and staff exhibit, which are equally important. We have to ensure an appropriate culture exists and is cultivated within the organization, reflecting the core values of our organization. And also I would like to mention here some more points, like effective care for patients should be based on good quality evidence. Guidelines, and also another important point, while following the guidelines here, Guidelines and standards do not replace the need for exper experienced clinical judgment exercised by the clinician. Now we see uh, our cases, with difficult cases we managed in the recent past. Case number one, a 20 year old female recently came to our department in the month of December with this year of uh, polyarthritis for 20 days. Investigative workup showed uh, high inflammatory markers, positive, strongly positive ANA and double standard DNA. So we confirmed the clinical diagnosis as lupus. We started on methotrexate, low dose steroids, and hydroxychloroquine. Two weeks later, she came to our uh, OPD with history of few days history of honor of low grade fever and weight loss of two kgs and uh, on the day one of her illness, she had six to seven episodes of loose motions. So when she attended the OPD, just what she was looking for is a quick fix for her a problem. But uh, she was reluctant for any test, but we insisted that she should undergo as a minimum test. So to our surprise, the test showed falling in hemoglobin, WBC went down to 1,500, platelets also dropping down to one lakh, and liver enzymes nearly more than 1,000. So what are the differentials here? Is it viral or a drug-induced like methotrexate induced bone marrow suppression? So patient and relatives were uh, reluctant for admission, but we counseled them properly. Uh, so finally, they agreed for admission. After admission, to our surprise, what we saw is ESR dropped down. It was 58 uh, in OPD two weeks ago, dropped down to 18. And uh, dengue serology positive. Rest of the infective workup was negative. So now I would like to ask you, any of you can come up with any differential at this point of time. So falling. ESR, cytopenias, and the high liver enzymes. So is it dengue or bone marrow suppression due to previous use of methotrexate or just a, a lupus flare because it was diagnosed very recently two weeks ago. We started treatment probably, the treatment didn't help her because it's only two weeks duration and she was on very low dose of steroids. So is a part of the disease flare. Any thoughts? So because uh, dengue fever, dengue positive. So we discussed with Dr. Pratik. He told clearly one point, very important point that helped really in this case. 
is he said dengue positivity is it's a false positive test in this case clinically he is not fitting into the case is not fitting into dengue uh, in view of high liver enzymes we discussed that nitish patap um, he thought probably it is drug induced with the taxid induced uh, liver enzyme elevation but i discussed with him that i don't think it's clinically uh, mtx induced because she receives very small dose so 50 mg per week only two doses unlikely to cause hepatitis i thought it's part of the lupus flare so after admission anyone can guess what what is the next best test we can do so we discussed this case uh, among ourselves with our pgs and faculty so we thought we probably we are uh, dealing with the macrophage activation syndrome so we asked for one particular test serum ferritin it turned out to be very high it's more than 5000 so we treated her with treated her with uh, a pulse steroids and ivig you can see that subsequent days the white cell count improved platelets improved liver enzymes uh, normalizing slowly so on that day on day 5 the patient discharge because of the financial issues we discharged the patient a bit uh, early so final diagnosis macrophage activation syndrome in the background of lupus so these are the seven pillars of clinical governance which include clinical audit clinical effectiveness risk management information and technology education training uh, staff management and uh, patient and the public involvement so here we will see how many pillars we have touched upon in this case patient and public involvement patient and relatives were involved in shared decision making they were continuously and properly counseled all through risk management we risk as we minimize the risk considerably in this case suppose if we treated her as a dengue we could have delayed the diagnosis of mas if we had treated for methotrexate induced toxicity with folinic acid and uh, colony stimulating factor again we could have delayed the diagnosis that could have led to admission to icu because the mass can have a multi organ failure and a dic like picture patient ultimately may need dialysis or ventilator support the bill may go up to 15 to 20 lakhs and the mortality morbidity is very high is uh, as bad as 50% mortality in macrophage activation syndrome so successfully we minimize the risk in this case audit and the audit so whatever uh, uh, knowledge we have gained from the previous you know treating similar case in the past has helped us in this case so and education training dnb residents were actively involved and learned from this case we used clinical effectiveness in this case and also staff were actively involved in this case so take your message from this case accurately diagnosing and early accurately diagnosing early and good team work minimize the risks involved in this case that led to early recovery early discharge of the patient any questions in this case sir great case my question is what led to this macrophage background lupus sir sometimes they can present straight away with mass there is no reason for that part of the difference. part yeah is it just a trigger sir so, and serum ferritin levels of the generation that that is the main important indicator madam so here if you see infection if you think infection the esr should go up in infection we may see the leukocytosis sometimes thrombocytosis but here all the three cell lines drop down and falling esr he is a good indicator of macrophage activation syndrome and serif serif ferritin really helps in confirming the diagnosis bone marrow actually normal in this case we did bone marrow uh, but uh, 
doesn't it be always uh, you know you see hemophagocytosis in this case we, we didn't see but clinically she fit into the diagnosis of uh, mass and we treated accordingly and patient recovered So, sir, we want to buy the time here. That window period is very important, in, especially in rheumatology cases. If we lost that window period of opportunity in investigations, we are lost. Sometimes even 20, especially in lupus, lupus is a time bomb. If we lose the time period when you are investigating, you are delaying the diagnosis. So bone marrow is not a lethal thing. It's a very routine procedure. So simultaneously, we, 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 we ordered, sir. The other thing is, because the patient was on a methotrexate, we wanted to rule out whether methotrexate has caused any damage to the bone marrow. That is the reason we did, sir. But I don't think it's an expensive, it's an, no, sir, no. Here, actually, we saved lakhs of rupees. And unnecessary, unnecessary admission for a long time in this case. So compared to that, bone marrow is not expensive. Yeah, I, I think I, I agree with you. Because serotherapy can rise in so many Of course, but we have to, we have other parameters to, uh, you know, that help in arriving at the diagnosis and ultimately the patient safety and recovery, which we demonstrated in this case. Case number two, 62 year old uh, male is, uh, <clears throat> present with myalgias for two months, history of difficulty in uh, uh, standing from squatting position, difficulty in getting up from the lying down position, combing the hair, holding objects, difficulty turning on the uh, bed uh, for uh, two months, got aggravated five days before admission. So clinically he has evidence of myositis more proximal weakness than uh, distal weakness, but he had no rash at the time of admission. Initially, he was admitted uh, under neurology. Liver enzymes were elevated. CPK was 14,000. Autoimmune serology workup, including myositis profile, was negative. Tumor work is negative. PET CT showed uh, intense muscle uptake. So initially, he was treated with pulse steroids. He also received detoxmap first dose. Initially, there is a transient improvement in steroids, but clinically further deteriorated. And also, they noticed new onset of ecmotic rash in the thighs. Uh, liver, um, muscle biopsy showed the evidence of dermatomyositis. So at that point of time, rheumatology I team was involved. So we agreed with the diagnosis of dermatomyositis. And because there is a clinical deterioration, the threat of receiving high-end therapy, we advised IVIG, but already that uh, treating team treating team thought that sufficiently managed, no further immunomodulation. Uh, the patient was discharged on uh, 60 milligrams of steroids with uh, priming with ABA further, along with mycophenolates. So then the, <clears throat> somehow they were not happy uh, because there was no improvement. They came to us uh, for second opinion five days after the discharge. So again, we because IVH we couldn't give at that point of time in the previous admission. So we, uh, we admitted him just to give IVIG and then discharge. So at that point of time, what I did, I, uh, I sat with my team, we retook the history again, and uh, see are we missing any points here. So one important uh, point uh, uh, came from the family is, uh, Patient and the wife had a holy dip in the river a couple of months ago. And both wife and uh, uh, himself had a viral prodrome. But wife recovered, but the patient continued to worsen the symptoms, more myalgias and uh, uh, more muscle weakness. So finally, he landed here. So we did some literature search uh, which shows that viral myositis can mimic like dermatomyositis. So we discussed the same thing with the patient and relatives. So we changed the diagnosis uh, from autoimmune myositis to viral myositis. We tapered the steroids gradually. We deferred the IVIG therapy. Uh, then we discharged just on the day two of the admission. We stopped the background DMARTs 
advised the active physiotherapy. Recently, he came to our OPD last week. So three weeks later, we saw him in the OPD. He was doing well on tapping steroids. At that point of time, he was on 10 milligrams. Now we reduced to 5 mg. Now he is able to walk on his own and able to get up from uh, chair with little support. He is continuing physio. So final diagnosis, viral myositis. So here we will again see how many pillars we have touched upon, seven pillars of the clinical governance. Clinical effectiveness, revise the diagnosis treated accordingly. Risk management, we stop the DMARDS and high-end immunomodulation, including steroids. Education training, DNB residents were involved actively in this case. They learned from this case. Patient and uh, relatives, they were counseled properly each point of their time. And uh, staff were actively involved in this case. Take home message, importance of reading history, reviewing literature, active teamwork led to revision of the diagnosis and modification of treatment. Any questions in this case? If not, we'll go to targets because I have a series of cases. So uh, I'm sure you would love these cases because each case taught us something. Yeah, Sharad. Could be because it, it's, yeah. Uh, here, why, why we presented is we have learned from this case. It's not point someone or someone not, not to blame someone. We have learned from this case. We, we actually we have taken the uh, we have taken the opinion on the <clears throat> biopsy based on that also we have taken the decision and uh, if, if because now he has a very low dose that that, that low dose steroid wouldn't help for uh, autoimmune myositis that is not enough. No, actually, that one important thing. No, this is not a blame game. Of course, we all learn from our mistakes. Yeah, yeah, yeah sir. I mean, no, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm myself. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just making a point because we are trying to go through cases and see what everybody can learn from from that case. Uh, my question is not about who did what, but my question is how do we say affirmatively in hindsight that that is viral. Uh, let me finish, sir, please. So uh, histopathology is generally speaking, it just gives you circumstantial evidence. Histopathology for conditions, uh, or for a lot of conditions, will only confirm your clinical suspicions. It's not diagnostic except, for example, you're de dealing with malignancy or TB. Sharad, so in this complete. case... Sharad, yes, sir, Sharad one, sir. when we are tapping the steroids, the myositis will flare. That's very classical of autoimmune myositis because this is my area I know what I'm dealing with. And so, just, I, I just wanted to make a small point, sir. So is it possible that the steroid pulses that were given in the initial I, phase, I told clearly uh, when he was tapping the steroids, there is a deterioration of the symptoms. So the actually at that point of time, they suspected he's a steroid in just myopathy. Okay, so that is the reason we were involved. I, I hope you are allowed to ask questions, right? No, no, what we clearly so, I mentioned, clearly I mentioned I, I, while tapping the steroids, patient deteriorated. That is an odd thing. And you could see that while tapping the steroid just with supportive care, so naturally the patient recovered. That is a point here we have to learn. So because so, in autoimmune parasitis. Natural recovery will not will not take space. The patient may need 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg body weight steroids daily. So, so that, that uh, so my, I'm just asking some questions. So, yeah. dermatomyositis, do everybody respond to steroids? Or will there be a subset that, that, that also, may not respond to steroids? Patient also received detection map. In the background, patient also received microphyllite. Sometimes they may respond to a single therapy, so we may have to add on a second or third line agent. They may not always. That is the reason I myself recommended IVIG. Why I deferred in the I, I, second admission? I take your point, sir. I yeah. think I, 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 I haven't yet finished my point. Yeah. 
So basically what I'm saying is that uh, at the end of this, a lot of times autoimmune disease can itself burn out versus a viral myositis. All I'm saying is we still need to keep an open mind and we cannot be we cannot be sure that this is viral myositis. Do we have any diagnostic marker that affirmatively tells us that of it's course, a viral, these viral patients myositis? Come for regular follow up. If I miss my diagnosis again, I'll present this case again in this forum. Sure. So uh, always we are uh, open for the criticism. Yes. Yeah, so, we learn from our cases. For example, in my own clinic, sometimes I diagnose a case of rheumatoid. Three years and died down the line. The diagnosis has changed to uh, oncosis vasculitis. It happened, GPA. Three years ago, rheumatoid. Three years down the line, we changed the diagnosis to GPA. It happened. Suriatic arthritis counted with lupus after three, four years because they are evolving diseases. Yes, that's, that's, that's precisely my point. Yeah, we always so learn do... from our experiences. So, so, uh, you... so sorry, sir. I'm, I'm just. Yeah, because there are so yes, many yes. cases. Uh, 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 of course, I'm not going into the scientific content because the uh, domain is so different and uh, we're not really competent to get into the scientific. I'm sure it must be a great uh, scientific uh, content. But uh, as I see in a broad view, there is some empiricism involved here in changing the diagnosis. Now, my question is not about the, the reason why you change or the evidence for it, but the, the basic theme of uh, this meeting, which is clinical governance. Now, uh, when there is a conflict of diagnosis involved within uh, just five days of time, how did you manage to communicate this to the patient's attendance without uh, clear scientific evidence? I think that Sir, we have my... done that. We have, we have done that. No, yeah. I think we will have to document that for our benefit. I think that is more important than, okay, the, there will be different forums for uh, showing the scientific content, but uh, to show how the seven pillars of, of uh, you know, what you're talking of, how uh, these are satisfied in your cases. I think that is more important yeah, by documenting, not just by a verbal uh, thing that this is satisfied, this is satisfied, that may not be enough for, of uh, evidence for all that. Sir, yeah, in all our records, we always document what we discuss with the patient. You know, how and do you actually, document if you have shown uh, that would have been good? Sir, yeah, but actually, Sir, there's so many things you can't on the slides. Actually, patient son is a doctor. So we could able to counsel not only the patient, his son who is working with us here. So, sir, in the clinical governance, the main point here is we have to learn from from our uh, experience and, and move on and improve our uh, uh, Services, that, that is the main thing. And not only that, here, all the cases, what we are discussing, uh, we had a second diagnosis. First hit was wrong. All, my case, all the cases are treated in this department only. Third case, a 40 year old uh, farmer, one week history of fever followed by myalgia, it has a viral uh, uh, myalgia outside. He was seated. Subsequently, next three months he developed. Uh, next three weeks, significant muscle weakness. Then he came to uh, Kim's. At that point of time, his liver enzymes were high. CPK more than more than fourteen thousand. Even we showed myopathic pattern. We thought of uh, immune mediated myositis treated with uh, IV pulse therapy. Uh, Auto immune ser serology workup was negative, including myositis profile, tumor markers negative. Chart CT showed generalized patchy uptake in the skeletal muscles because there was no improvement uh, with. Uh, Pulse steroids, uh, we gave him IVLG. Um, in the sex phase, subsequent days, there's a further deterioration of the liver enzyme. CPK went up to more than a lakh. At this point of time, he developed the acute kidney injury due to severe rhabdomyolysis. <clears throat> 
So muscle biopsy showed extensive muscle fiber necrosis. So here, um, our the differential here is, is it immune mediated myositis because it can also cause muscle necrosis or is it some viral myositis or, or some toxic myopathy? We don't know. The patient actually stayed for nearly three months in, in MICU2. So at this point of time, we try to, again, revisit the case. Are we doing something uh, wrong? Why the patient is not improving clinically? So, so when I went back to the patient's relatives and asked uh, any other history we are missing. So the patient, our relatives told us that as a farmer, he continuously exposed to pesticide for for very long time, unprotected exposure. Regarding the same case, I uh, discussed this case with several other colleagues across the country uh, in the rheumatology field. So we thought probably we are not dealing with autoimmune myositis. Probably it's toxic myopathy, secondary to <coughs> pesticides. So we de-escalated the therapy. We continued to give the support care in the form of hemodialysis and physiotherapy. We stopped the background disease modification drugs. We tapered the steroids gradually, and we were able to discharge. He completely improved kidney-wise because he had AKI, needed dialysis for uh, more than a few weeks, three or four weeks. Now he's off dialysis. He's in uh, rehab care in Hyderabad. Now he's self-caring and able to walk on his own. So here, what are the pillars we have touched upon in this case with regard to clinical governance? So there are six out of seven uh, uh, pillars we have touched in this case. So another case is 11 year um, This boy he used to live in the US um, before he came to us. At the age of five years, he was diagnosed as a case of CRMO, chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis. It was diagnosed in Boston Children's Hospital. He was treated with uh, biologics, NSAIDs, and methotrexate on and off steroids. At the age of 11, the family moved to India. So treating rheumatologist from Boston referred the case to our department. So we conquered with the diagnosis of CRMO. We continued background DMARS and steroids, but on and off he used to have uh, uh, bony pains. In 2019, he came for regular follow-up, but to a surprise, we noticed hematuria and auxiliary crystals in the urine. And also we notice painless lump in the, in the right elbow. You can see the calcification there. So then um, we thought we are missing something. This is not CRMO because there are some odd features against uh, the diagnosis of CRMO. So we did some further workup. Uh, Dr. Amrita, our uh, Finally, PG now, we took a special interest in this case. So we noticed that uh, serum phosphates were, it was very high. When we went back and actually we saw the previous records also showed from uh, USA, high phosphate, they missed that bit there. And Dr. Amrita, she was in touch with CCMB um, to work up for this case. And we have asked for FGF 23, which was elevated. So the testing in CCMB showed a new mutation in GAL NT3. So we changed the diagnosis accordingly as hyperphosphatemic tumoral calcinosis. Now we changed the treatment completely. It was on low phosphate diet, phosphate binders, it is acetazolamide and monthly pamidronate for the past two years. <coughs> He's off steroids, off painkillers, off DMARTs. For the past two years, no subsequent attacks. Doing well. 
So what are the seven pillars we touched upon here? Clinical effectiveness and research. Revise the diagnosis after thorough literature search. Risk management to stop DMOT steroids tapered. Earlier he was on biologics, so no more use of biologics. Education training. Residents were actively involved in managing the case. <coughs> they collaborated with CCMB for genetic analysis. Patient enrollment. Relatives were actively involved in shared decision making in this case. And also IT and staff management. Any questions? How many cases? This is the first case, ma'am. One point Recently, uh, ENT surgeon Mahesh and I, we encountered a case of uh, uh, which finally was diagnosed as a phosphaturic mesenchymal tumor, where uh, the literature says that uh, removing the, the, this patient has been having these uh, phosphaturic symptoms for the last 10 years. He was with somebody else. Uh, and we then have, we have a similar case. I'm going to present that also. Okay. So uh, it says that when we excise the tumor, they are free of the symptoms. Correct. Correct. Uh, yes. Thank you. Case number five. It's a 45 year old male. Sir, do we need a confirmation with Sanger sequencing or that is enough, sir? Sorry, um, Sanger sequencing. Normal after the exome, they confirm it by a Sanger sequencing, sir. Uh, I, I'm not aware. I, I'm just. Uh, okay. Sir. Case number five, a 45 year old uh, male. I think uh, we are dealing the same case here. What you are discussing now. 45 year old male is a general practitioner uh, from Gadwal. Um, he has been visiting several corporate hospitals and rheumatologists for the past three years with a diagnosis of spondyloarthritis. He used Lots of painkillers, steroids, methotrexate. He was on a biologic injection like Adilimab and recent, uh, recently has been on Tofaslim. He had no improvement, so he visited us in month of December. <coughs> so initially we agreed with the diagnosis of spondyloarthritis. We continued DMARDS, we changed the combination a little bit. So he came for the second visit on the following month. That is actually in the January. This month he came. So then um, I asked of my one of my PGs, Dr. Amrita, Amrita, we are missing the diagnosis here. Please retake the history, go through all the files. So she retook the history. To our surprise, actually, he's not giving a proper history suggest to of inflammatory pains. How do we know patient has inflammatory pain? Any pain, either a back pain or joint pain, if it lasts for more than 45 minutes in the morning, that is inflammatory pain. Classically, this patient has, hasn't got that kind of nature of pain. He says whenever he moves, he gets the pain. In his in the resting position, he's fine. So that is against uh, spinal arthritis. And also, we, when we saw the old records, to our surprise, inflammatory markers were normal all the time. If it is spinal arthritis, we'd see some elevation, some other, other point of the time. And the previous chest fracture showed lip fractures, lip fractures, which was missed by the previous leading doctors. So we wanted to rule out metabolic bone disease. So we ordered certain tests which showed low calcium, high PTH, low phosphorus, and alkaline phosphorus is high. Again, FGF 23 is elevated in this case. So we did uh, uh, daughter NAC PET CT, which showed uh, uh, well-defined soft tissue density in the nostril septum. So this standard case of oncogenic osteomalacia. Good thing about this tumor is when you excise this tumor, the patient completely symptom-free, patient doesn't need any kind of chemotherapy or radiotherapy most of the times. Of course, the patient needs a regular follow-up. So here, uh, what are the seven pillars and how many of we have touched upon in this case? So we revise the diagnosis here. Whatever knowledge gained from treating uh, similar cases helped in this case, we stop background steroids and DMARDs. 
And we touch actually all the pillars of uh, clinical governance in this case. Any questions? No. So we missed it. That's the reason we're presenting. We, we, we missed in the first, first month. We, we, actually, I'm admitting that I did mistakes. I learned from the mistakes. No, even there is a whole, but this is a, the whole exercise is because of that. Please. Learn from our mistakes every day. Please let us exchange views in a low no, voice. Please, sir. Low yeah. voice. No I'm need open. to raise your voice. Please. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is. Sir. And my, to my knowledge, even in orthopedics also, where the diagnosis most of the times depends on just an X-ray, uh, taking proper history is very, very important. Of course, and then clinical examination yeah. before you go for any sort of investigations. That's what I believe in. I practice also. Here, the initial examiner, whoever it is, after coming to Kim's also, they have missed the very, very simple and it won't cost anything to take the history properly. Sir, Why I tell you the reason. We are flooded with patients in India. We don't have time. I feel actually embarrassed sometimes. I don't have time to even shake hand my patients. See, if I can understand. Sorry, the reason is we are flattered to the patients. When I was in England, I used to see some max and 12, 13 cases a day. Here I see 60, 70 cases. Whatever infrastructure we have, we are doing our best. We are, we are the best treating doctors in the entire world, I would say. No, 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 I, I agree. I am not disputing all that. No. And it is doesn't matter how many cases, even if I am doing 100, I must do justice to my I patient. Agree, sir, totally agree. This and, is a basic point. We should not miss any point. Yeah, second thing is, if I miss a key investigation, that I can understand. Sir. But taking a simple history, when particularly in rheumatology. Sir, actually, sir, the reason I tell you, sir, patients sometimes don't give a proper history. So when we retake the history, sometimes that really helps, especially with back pain or the joint pains, they confuse us. So when we retook the history second time, it really helped. Sir, uh, I can understand why there's a discordance between the speaker and the audience here. So what we tried, you, these are very good cases, the clinical vignettes. And what you have tried to do here is tell the success stories but since we are all reeling from the onslaught of the previous Tuesday, so, it's, so we should actually spend some time in understanding, is this the template on which the next uh, uh, speakers would be speaking? And we need some clarity. So we, actually, we should be learning from the mistakes. So it, once there are mistakes, so we can come forward and uh, rectify them Present. or... Huh? Or, yeah, I think the clinical governance team should screen. sit. I, I think you should stay a bit away from the I'm sorry, mic. Yeah. It's resonating I'm sorry. all over and uh, people are not no, able yeah. to. So if there are more mis uh, cases where mistakes are pointed out and accepted and we and how you suggest that we can improve on that, that would be setting the template for the next speakers. Uh, what do you think? Please? Hello. Sir. Hello. Ah, sir. Director Mali, see basically Mali, what you are presenting is there as rightly Samrit has pointed out. Let all the speakers give their opinions. You don't need to answer immediately. It is only a feedback that we are taking from what don't think everybody is perfect on their own. We need to improvise how to improvise the clinical governance. Next week I will present what exactly is the entire summary that you people have done. Let Thank them you. ask questions and you take it. Whether you are right or wrong is not the important thing. It is the, for the entire uh, population, doctors as well as the patients to get a maximum benefit out of this discussion. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. No, basically, <clears throat> Dr. Sambit Sharat, what Dr. Sharat is presenting is at an individual level and an individual patient level. Uh, whereas clinical governance is an overarching thing that includes the entire institution, entire organization. So there are multiple areas that need to be covered. So th that uh, we, we will uh, go through in, in next week. So I mean, I actually made a presentation on clinical governance uh, five years ago. So I will dish it out and present and also we will look more into it. I mean, this is at a sort of a micro level. So uh, please, Sharat, yeah. we will have a discussion. Let me have yeah. a couple of cases. Uh, this is a cab driver, next case, 50 year old male uh, cab driver from Hyderabad has been visiting uh, uh, 
other uh, rheumatologist in uh, in the city in a corporate hospital three months history of unwell fever on and off non productive cough and um, thigh swelling with ingestion and right ankle swelling in the previous hospital uh, report showed high inflammatory markers initially he was managed as a left thigh cellulitis there was no improvement they did a skin biopsy uh, which showed fat necrosis with granulomas formation and pet ct was uh, done it showed evidence of query iotitis he was on, he was put on steroids probably he didn't take the steroids he was uh, he not happy so he came to us for a second opinion uh, in kims uh, sir uh, dr ivred sir uh, with your permission what you have question here my pg dr ramya she took the history from this case you can see that the other on, on your right side so dr ramya we took the history from the case uh, so additionally we got information of he has history of renal calcula in the past he has dry eyes dry mouth constant symptoms and evidence of erythema nodosum uh, in the legs and also ankle arthritis so straight away without any further work up she could diagnose a case of sarcoid of course we did so further testing to confirm so clinically we confirmed the case the case of sarcoid patient was uh, put on uh, demox and low dose steroids um, and he has been symptom free has been coming regularly to our clinic for the past 3 months so here you can see we touched upon all 7.7 pillars of clinical governance in this case so another interesting case from our kims 43 year old male unwell for 3 months initially with history of joint pain polyarthralgias high grade intermittent fever significant weight weight loss of 25 kg skin rashes breathlessness so initially he was treated in general medicine with a prob probable diagnosis of brucellosis he was treated accordingly there was no improvement then he was referred to rheumatology based on the clinical symptoms and signs we diagnosed at that point of time as a case of dermatomyositis with ild and mda5 positive one interesting point at this point of time is this is the second covid peak wave time so we saw a spot of mda5 related ilds at that point of time so initially we started him on methotrexate and a good dose of steroids uh, there was no response do we change the treatment to iv pulse sorry uh, uh, cyclophosphamide plus pulse steroids but he further deteriorated admitted with uh, uh, further desaturation needing 8 liters of oxygen fever continuous and the breathlessness increased at this point of time we were not sure are we dealing with any uh, background chest infection uh, with the uh, background ild uh, so we started him on uh, high end antibiotics so uh, we did some literature search um, so there is a japanese study at this point at that point of time in difficult mda5 uh, positive uh, cases of ild they tried uh, a new uh, combination cyclophosphamide tacrolimus so we started uh, this new combination for this patient at this point of time they ran out of money so they went on lama so just few couple of hours before he went on lama along with my residents i went to patient sat for half an hour i counsel him we'll take the financial responsibility you don't worry then uh, patient we readmitted him my resident dr ramya and uh, dr harsha they raised uh, money by crowdfunding and also hospital gave a good amount of discount with this uh, new combination therapy now he completely improved repeat ct showed the uh, good improvement in ild lung sac clinically much better now he is off oxygen he is back to his occupation now four months later 
So here you can see we have uh, touched upon six out of seven pillars of clinical governance. And uh, we have treated, I think, around nine patients of ILD, MD, AFI, supposed to be very aggressive and patient may lose lives. All patients survived from KIMS with ILD, MD, AFI positive. The power of observation. The eye cannot see what the mind doesn't know. Only one can look at something and see beyond what the mind knows, can discover the new things and, 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 and enhance the understanding. We have to have an inquisitive mind. In our busy hospital clinics, take a moment to pause and think of what we see is all that is needed to allow the eye to see what the mind doesn't know. This is the best example. Recently, we treated this case. He is a 13-year-old uh, male from Kakinada. Initially, in the month of October 2021, he had a pneumonitis, responded to steroids, treated locally. Subsequently, he used to have on and off herbal swelling, treated as cellulitis with antibiotics outside. He came to us with history of polyarthritis and uh, herbal swelling. And he had high inflammatory markers. Clinically, we thought probably we are dealing with a, a kind of a GPA or some sort of vasculitis or IgG4 disease. Uh, when we did bone marrow, which showed the uh, cytoplasm vaccination myeloid series, and autoimmune serology workup completely negative. And uh, FDG PET CT showed uh, uh, evidence of uh, vasculitis in the large vessels. So at that point of time, our PGs uh, um, did the latest research. There is a new syndrome called VEXA syndrome, which wasn't reported from this part of the world till recently. So we suspected that we sent the sample to Chandigarh, where they diagnosed the first case of VEXAs in India. So to our surprise, as we suspected, uh, this test is positive for VEXA syndrome. So this is the second case of VEXA from India. So first case from South India. So we treated him with uh, DMARS and steroids. He's symptom free ever since. What are the learning points uh, from this presentation? Question your own diagnosis when you're in doubt, taking and retaking the history and medical examination, reading and literacy research, discussion with team members, good teamwork, cross collaboration with other departments and other institutes if necessary, openness to the patient and shared decision making, managing the risks of efficiently, mitigate the risks, effective management and up to date with the treatment, regular strict monitoring is very important. The last point in clinical governance is safe and effective, safe and effective person-centered care is important. In conclusion, clinical governance is crucial improving standards of care that the patient receives. Thank you. From the clinical uh, governance perspective, is uh, the point of discussion between you and uh, Dr. Ivy Reddy about uh, the clinic being flooded with uh, patients and uh, in each patient not being able to take history properly at the first instance? We always do. No. Sometimes we do miss. The, re the reason no, no, is the, because the, of lack the, of time. No, 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 Sharath, please. Uh. The point of clinical governance is not to have effective checkpoints in place, not to miss those patients. So in the flood of 100, 150, whatever number you see in a month, you should have SOPs in, from the, I'm talking from the, please don't take it personally yeah, and, and let, let it not be a, be yeah. So you should have checkpoints, yeah. 10 patients come, you have to risk stratify them. Is this patient a routine run of the mill? You just see, write the repeat prescription, just uh, raise any red flags. If there are no red flags, just write a prescription again and say, come back after one month. So that is what clinical governance comes into picture. So you need to have an SOP in place when 
a number of patients visit the clinic, not just your clinic, I mean, any clinic. I mean, we see this uh, mala in many uh, departments. So all the departments, they have to look at their own uh, ways of working and how to receive the patient and how to risk stratify the patient, who should see the patient first, and then how it should be escalated to the consultant. All these things come in clinical governance. That, that, that is what we need to look at and how to improve the systems and having effective systems in place. So that it, just one small aspect of clinical governance. So again, the audit is the next aspect. You look at how many patients walks through the door, how many of them fitted, fitted the bill of your own SI, SOP, and you do this periodically. So, the, the, I mean, again, as you know, this is a very small aspect of clinical governance. So, thank you. Thank you. So when Dr. Baskara asked me to do this, I had no idea how to do this. Can I so, just, uh, sir, sorry, after you. So you actually, sir, see, um, Dr. Baskara wanted that clinical governance in my case sheets. I don't know how to put it. So finally, I figured out this is how I can present it. So if there are any mistakes, please pardon me. No, 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 no. We are not trying to point out any mistakes, actually, for our own improvement and understanding. It's because this... No, this particular hall has physicians, surgeons covering almost all the branches of medicine. So we are talking here something general principles. Uh, I am uh, ignorant of majority of what you have known in dermatology, so I will not be able to comment. It is not uh, right on my part also to comment on that. I am trying to point out only the general aspects. And particularly for the juniors, I must say, I have, we have to go back to the basics. Taking history is so important and clinical examination. So you don't straight away go for images, you know, scans. Nowadays, we see many times in orthopedic practice, people come with an MRI scan without even having a basic X-ray of that part. How pitiable the situation is. And I must say, as experienced physicians and surgeons at our level, like you and me, most of the times the problem is a spotter for me, I can say, at least in orthopedics. When the patient walks into my clinic, and says a few words about his complaint, I can spot the diagnosis. And by that is what the, I think Prasad was trying to point out. We must be able to differentiate serious cases with red flags and the other routine cases. A clinician, senior clinician can do this within no matter, within a matter of few seconds actually. It won't take more than one or two minutes to do that. And suppose if there are red flags, then hand it over to one of your subordinates, like a registrar or BNB, to go into the details of the history and examination, everything. And I must say, by going into the details of the history and the clinical examination, you can narrow down the number of investigations that are required. That also, that also comes under clinical governance. You must render this treatment with minimum cost. Unnecessary investigation need to be avoided. And uh, the management, I don't know how they react to me. If you see in my practice, I see so many cases of back pain and so many varieties of um, orthopedic problems. But do you know, I may not be doing more than two or three MRIs in a month. Not necessary. If you are thorough with your clinical examination and uh, taking history and taking the proper X-rays, you can avoid unnecessary investigations. And the management also should encourage such sort of practice. There must be random checks. Clinical governance means it's not just the <coughs> clinician's part, management also. Sir, here uh, I admitted my mistakes. I corrected my mistakes. So clinical governance I, is I, I think, to I, that. I think just Sorry. one second. It is not for knowing your mistakes. How what is all this about is to find out how do we improve. Because all of us, nobody can say, I have never committed a mistake in my life. Can we do that? That means either we have not worked or we are lying, right? So what is it we all learn from our mistakes, but that's the reason, as he has said, that is experience. And nowadays, what we are seeing is lot of experience, lot of experience is, Mainly not in this way. Yeah. So that is what. Yeah. Hello, I think uh, the time is uh, morning. All the points are well taken. The last slide, I was very, very important on that. How the last slide, 
into practice daily in the case writing we will able to elaborate and create some headings based on this clinical governance and implement in every day i don't think we can able to avoid as possible all the mistakes as long as i will have come i think i i will ready or not at many of the clinical uh, uh, this tuesday meeting i keep on telling i am not at all interested to write more investigations i feel very bad if somebody is writing more investigations he is not the good physician or a good surgeon a person who has a clinical knowledge should not uh, write more investigations that's what i keep telling every day even if i have the neurology department i need five mris if anybody is writing an investigation like that i am very happy if you treat more clinically rather than investigation basis investigations are required to confirm your clinical knowledge not anything else okay next week i think we will present a little better the last slide of the summary how we need to be able to improvise so that the patients will be totally safe when they are leaving the organization sir okay. thank you sir for okay. just uh, one word sir thank you very much for your uh, final statement uh, you also encourage not unnecessarily doing the investigation all i know and i understand i appreciate that as far as my absence in the clinical meetings is there is a reason for that if you talk if you select the topics which will be useful for everybody here because here just not one medical department or something like that so many departments as i said skims has almost all the sub specialties everything so the topic that is selected should be useful to everybody uh, the other day i had i am not blaming anybody here uh, say i saw a topic where placenta accreta this this who will be interested in that topic say except for the uh, antenna the obstetricians and gynecologists so we have to select the topics which will be of some concern for some usefulness for everybody if you do that i will attend every meeting i i promise so, you i will uh, i will put you into the uh, this academic uh, one of the member in that to select the topic that okay. the entire year i am going to concentrate only on the clinical governance by each and every department will be involved in that that is the reason i told last tuesday that's why even i am away from the auditorium i am discussing and i am very very serious that we need to improvise our government okay that's the way we can able to over okay. sir, thank you sir uh, dr sambit and uh, dr baskar i think uh, uh, sir spoke to the three of us me dr sharachandra mohli and dr mbv the if i understand correctly the i think what we should uh, i mean we're going to have another meeting like this next tuesday so what i can just give a small example of how we can take it forward for example we looked at the the consent forms that we have for endoscopy in our department and then we've been doing uh, the consenting is not standardized in our department and there have been a couple of issues with patients who undergone a procedure and then have had a event post procedure and if we look at that and what is the mandate for good consent there is a difference in 